Welcome to the final session for the week seven screencasts. So in this session, we'll be covering a little bit of lab preparation. Now in the lab for this week, we will be covering a numerical simulation of a falling ball system. So this is where we have some ball that's held at some height above ground. And then we let go of that ball and it falls towards ground. The equation that describes this system is called Newton's second law. And the students that are also studying pH 1005 should know that Newton's second law is equal to the sum of the forces acting on a body is equal to mass times the acceleration of the body. Now, these are both vectors, but because we're only working in one dimension, so straight up and down, I'm not going to use vector notation just to make it a little bit easier on myself. So, first we need to work out what forces are actually working on this ball. Our first obvious force is weight force. So this is how gravity acts on a body and the magnitude of that force is equal to mass times gravity. And the direction that that force works in is towards the ground. The other force acting on the body is drag force, which is equal to one half times some drag coefficient multiplied by the density of the fluid that we're working in multiplied by the cross-sectional area and the direction of travel multiplied by the velocity squared. So all these terms that are in front of the velocity are going to be constants. So all these ones. And to save myself some writing time, I'm just going to say that our drag force is equal to some constant k multiplied by v squared. Now, substituting these values back into our Newton's second law, we get that mass times acceleration is equal to mass times gravity minus, because it's working in drag works in the direction opposite to velocity, minus kb squared. Now, if we re rearrange this slightly, we get that A equals G minus K on M B squared. Now, because acceleration is some function of time and velocity is some function of time, we don't have definitions for either of those functions, this system becomes a little bit trickier to solve. So what we do is break the system down into smaller steps where these values are going to be constant over those steps. This is called discretizing our system. Now to do this, we take the definitions of acceleration and velocity. So acceleration is the rate of change of velocity which is roughly equal to a small change in velocity over a small change in time. So this delta t is a time step that we define ourselves so that the approximation holds true and this change in velocity is what we're trying to calculate for. Similarly, we can say that velocity equals the rate of change of displacement, where I'm using S for displacement, and this is roughly equal to some change in displacement divided by some change in time. 
So if we're given an initial value of velocity and an initial value of displacement, we can say that our next velocity step minus the velocity from the previous step divided by time is our small change in velocity over a small change in time. And similarly, we can do the same thing with displacement, where the displacement at our new step minus the displacement at our old step uh, divided by time is our small displacement change over our small change in time. So if we say that our initial velocity E equals V0 and that value is 0 and our initial displacement S0 equals 0, we can determine what our next velocities are given the equations that we've derived. So our next value V1 we determine using our previous velocity value and the equations we defined before and we continue this process for all our steps. Similarly in these same steps we uh, generate new displacements as well. So we substitute our new value for acceleration into our Newton second law equation. So that's vi minus vi minus 1 on delta t, which is equal to g minus k on m v squared. Now, we need to determine which values we know and which values we don't know. So we know delta t, we know vi minus 1, we know g, we know k, we know m. So vi minus 1 is just the velocity at the previous step. vi is the value we're trying to calculate for. And this velocity that we have down here we have to substitute in either vi or vi minus 1 and the easier solution is just to use vi minus 1 because we already know that value. That becomes vi minus 1. And now we only have one unknown which is the vi. And we can solve for that value of vi now. Similarly we can say that vi equals si minus si minus 1 on delta t. And if we do the above equation first, then we know what the value for vi is, we know the displacement at the last step, we know what time is, and our only unknown is si. And that's the basis for this numerical simulation. So here I've got some pseudocode of um, how you would attempt this in MATLAB. We would define our initial values, which is V0 equals 0 and S0 equals 0. And we'd say, well, 5, which is an arbitrary height that I chose for this example, minus the displacement is greater than zero. Um, so this will keep going until it's moved five meters. We would generate a new value of velocity using a rearranged version of what we had before. And we'd do the same for displacement. And then we'd let this loop continue. Now, how you want to store these variables uh, is up to you. You might want to put them into an array so you can plot them easier later. And then you can show the displacement as a function of time or velocity as a function of time. So thank you and good luck with your lab this week.